Day and night, good and evil, life and death, left and right. Milton Acorn versus Ezra Pound, two of their poems. Milton Acorn's You Growing is compared to Ezra Pound's Francesca. Dialectical matter in motion versus an idealist framing of ideas. When poetry comes from the centers of power, it is seen as a deep reflection of philosophical thought. When writing comes from the margins, it is often dismissed as the mindless rhetoric of second-rate whiners. Today, in Canada, more university courses teach the poetry of Ezra Pound than teach Milton Acorn. Why is that? Pound's fascism is excused in the name of art. Acorn's communist activities are used as an easy justification to dismiss his work. Is it as simple as one was Amer an American trader and therefore of interest, and one was a Canadian patriot and therefore of no significance? Part of the problem is that Canadian artistic works are always seen as lesser versions of grander movements from elsewhere, and are never placed in the context of the ongoing struggle for our own forms of expression, which are indigenous, growing within the context of our own history, rooted in the very landscape from which it springs. I believe art comes from the land. Unfortunately, even the disciples of people's poetry in Canada claim it only took hold in Canada after progressive influences from the United States and England made their way to Toronto. In addition, my poetry has been compared to both William Wordsworth and Allen Ginsberg. You might think this should make me happy, but if on the margins you have no name of your own, inevitably your works are compared to aspects of other poets and artistic movements from the center. And it means you come to be labeled as only romantic-like and only beat-like a mere colorless shadow silhouetted by the sublimes from afar. Until you have your own brand, you cannot really be studied as a freestanding artistic entity, and a canon of works cannot be created which will bring together the expressions of your collective art, which is produced within the context of a shared community and history. For a trajectory of vivid creative development only grows out of one's own environmental experience, and the delicate strength of this focus will only flourish if it is allowed up into the sunlight. If the center works to culturally conquer people, it will try to take away their language. If the center speaks the same language as you, it will take away your poetry. The center's poetry is presented as the grand poetry of grand masters at the head of world-class artistic movements, each with their own well-defined name. At best, poetry from the margins can be labeled as like theirs. External forms and trends set the standards because benchmarks from the center are presented as the pinnacle of achievement. When there is no signifier 
For what your community distinctively writes, your poetry cannot be signified. There is only a lament for a nation which, for 300 years, has had no real poetry. For this reason, I have self-labeled the tradition I write within. I am an omnigothic neo-futurist. However, the purpose of this video is not to define and explain omnigothic neo-futurism. I will leave that for the future videos, and for now we'll let you struggle with how omnigothic neo-futurism might be a label operating in contrast to the so-called postmodern era we are now supposed to be living in. I would love to hear your reaction in the comments, especially if you are a dyed-in-the-wool postmodernist. Getting back to the two poems, You Growing and Francesca, let us compare and contrast them. Let us pick apart their forms. Let us take a good look at their content. Let us tie down the two poets and examine their poetics. Let's get all omnigothic neo-futurist on them. In contrast to a video rendition of these poems by myself, it was once common for a poet to physically stand in front of their audience. I don't have film versions of these poems being read by their poets, but I can place in front of you two physical representations that shed light upon these subjects in question. The first is a fine line drawing of Milton Acorn by the Canadian artist Greg Kernow. The second is a harsh brushstroke representation of Ezra Pound by the modernist Goddard Berserka Acorn, in the Kernel drawing, is looking over his shoulder as a man might be rowing a boat towards a self-defined future, taking direction from where they'd been with only quick snatched glances at where they're going. His hair is windswept and unkept, his eyes well-defined and focused, his rotten-tooth smile, the half-cocked grin of a divine carnival gesture who, from the protection of his madness, views the world with a clarity that seems divine in inspiration. There is a sense of movement. There is an aura of life. It is a face exploding with organic fractal growth. In contrast, Ezra Pound is an image devoid of life. It is as if it were an embossed silhouette carved into a tombstone. The mouth is clenched shut, the eyes closed or at best standing, staring into the obscure reveries of the inward gaze. Even the hair, while falling forward, seems pressed rigid into place. This drawing comprises of four parts. The neck, the skull cap, the hair placed upon and in front of the skull cap, and the mask. A mask looking like the side view of a skeleton's face. Here fragments cast a lifeless fixed image that never moves with the sun's course. As I read these poems, take a good look at these images. Sit back and enjoy. They are both good examples of their aesthetics. Think about what you see and hear. You came out of the night, and there were flowers in your hands. 
now you will come out of a confusion of people out of a turmoil of speech about you i who have seen you amid the primal things was angry when they spoke your name in ordinary places i would that the cool waves might flow over my mind and that the world should dry as a dead leaf or as a dandelion seed pod and be swept away so that i might find you again alone You growing in your thought threading, the delicate strength of your focus. Out of a clamor of voices demanding faces and noises, apart from me, but vivid as when I kissed you and chuckled. Wherever you are, be fearless, and wherever I am, I hope to know you're moving vivid beyond me. So I grow by the strength of you fighting for yourself, many selves, your life, many lives, your people. In outward appearance, Acorn's dress blended in with the working people he identified so strongly with. Al Purdy describes them as a red fire hydrant wearing blue denims. Brian McCarthy, in a review from Canadian Forum, describes him thus. In appearance, Milton Acorn himself is vividly antediluvian. Heavy brow ridges, a face carved out of red rock, and a build that suggests the cave rather than the drawing room. I can't imagine anyone less like a PR man or a TV producer or any other kind of slicky. I remember seeing him once, standing halfway up a cliff in pouring Laurentian rain. It was a startling apparition, like the materialization of some local rock god. Ezra Pound did not blend into his environment. Pound even managed to stand out like a sore thumb in pre-World War I London. With green trousers made of billiard cloth, with his pink velvet coat and its blue glass buttons, a hand-painted tie, his mane of Rhenish blonde hair tucked under a sombrero, his green eyes, a beard cut to a point to resemble a Spanish conquistador, and as a final touch, a single turquoise earring. Pound strode the London streets as operatically endowed as any character of Puccini's. Born in Idaho and unable to make it as an academic in Indiana, Pound moved from America to Europe, first landing in England. He later moved to Paris and then on to Italy where he found his patron. In Ezra Pound, a solitary volcano, John Title states that when Pound met Mussolini, Mussolini told Pound that he found the Cantos de Verte entertaining. It is not surprising given Mussolini's admiration for Americans. The American people, by their sure and active creative lines of life have touched and touch my sensibility. I endlessly admire those who make out of creative work a law of life, who those who win with the ability of their genius and not 
with the intrigue of their eloquence. I am for those who make technique perfect in order to dominate elements and to give to men more sure footings for the future. In contrast to being an American winning with genius and making technique perfect in order to dominate, Milton Acorn was born on Prince Edward Island and traveled to England as part of the Canadian Army contingent going to fight the Second World War. Unfortunately, he was injured on his way over when his troop ship was attacked by submarines. While he was watching the defensive depth charges going off near his ship, his ears started to bleed from the pressure of the blast. And by the time he got to England, he was deemed unfit for service. Or at least this is how he told me the story. Acorn also later worked as a carpenter and further to not making technique perfect, Milt told a story of how he once built a house and forgot to put any doors or windows into it. In my youth, before I admitted to myself I was a poet, I took this story to be proof Acorn was nuts. <laughs> Fifty years later, I cannot help feel it is the apocryphal tale of a Zen master. Is a thing unto itself a house of walls and roof? with no doors and windows, with an interior form cut off from the context and experience of the external world? In his essay on not being banned by the Nazis, Acorn rails away at Ezra Pound and his fascist poetry. Acorn tells us to instead write poetry like his, you growing. What Acorn doesn't tell us is that his poem is a clever deconstructive rewrite of an earlier poem by Pound. If one definition of postmodernism is writing against modernism, Acorn's You Growing can be seen as a clear example of writing against Francesca, a poem by the well-known modernist Ezra Pound. It is also very postmodern to not be original in the way modernists claim to be, and to subvert earlier works by recontextualizing them. Was Acorn a postmodern writer? Perhaps. But given his bullet through the imitation brains, ethos, I can't help think Acorn saw poetry as guerrilla war, and like Che Guevara, he was not opposed to picking up the enemy's weapons and using them against the very aesthetics that forged them. Acorn even playfully taunts traditional academics in his essay, which attacks Pound, and he purposely does not mention Francesca, when he presents you growing. Is this an act of anti-originality subversion? I suspect he was hoping an academic one day would discover this hidden trigger and would step on it by then comparing the two poems in order to try and prove that Pound's originality was much superior to Acorn's reworking. And in doing so, prove the vicious absurdity of university criticism, since every writer knows all writing is built upon every previous work ever written. There is that academic house without any windows and doors again. And there is Acorn looking over his shoulder at them as he rolls backwards. Unfortunately, Acorn, for the most part, has been banned by academics and Canadian universities. So, as an omnigothic neo-futurist, I will step in and point out the obvious, trying to make the 
comparison of these two poems as entertaining as possible. In the poem, Francesca, Pound's desire is to have complete possession and control over the object of his love. His love and its object have become his property, an attitude that is best described by Karl Marx. Private property has made us so stupid and partial that an object is only ours when we have it, when it exists for us as capital, or when it is directly eaten, drunk, worn, inhabited, etc. In short, utilized in some way. Thus all the physical and intellectual senses have been replaced by the simple alienation of all the senses, the sense of having. This need on the part of Pound to possess Francesca is extended to the point of destroying the entire world so that cool ways might flow over him while the world should dry as a dead leaf. Sadly, Pound presents an ironic image of capitalist alienation, and a hundred years after this poem was written, the logical extension of this state of being rapidly becomes to be stuck, sitting transfixed by the medium cool waves of the internet as the planet around us dies. Furthermore, Francesca is lost a pound if she is apart from him. Once she came out of the night to fill the void he felt by filling it with an image of fertility. There were flowers in your hands. Now she is separated from him by a confusion of people and a turmoil of speech. So he addresses his object, Francesca, with the tone of command. Now you will come out of a confusion of people. Community is seen as chaos. The ordinary is seen as enemy. Primal order coming out of the night is the solution. But Pound, like most self-absorbed flamboyant poetic types, is only aware of his, need, of his need to stand out from what he sees as the ordinary and is blind to the fact he is making a fool of himself. Pound's desire for Francesca does not even make him happy. His need for control over her is so intense he becomes angry when someone even mentions her name. Francesca, as a separate being, isn't important to Pound. What is important is who she is seen by. This poem is not about love. This poem is about the power of Pound's gaze. This poem, without knowing it, is about capitalist alienation, feeding the desire for possessions within a well-ordered fascist state. And in the years before he was employed during World War II to spout anti-Jewish rhetoric over the radio paid by the Italian fascist government, his quest to reduce poems down to essentials was laying the philosophical groundwork for a modernist poetic purity to be pounded on podiums by the hands of hierarchical dictators. It could be supposed the root of this poem is Pound's feelings and not his politics. Certainly, his aesthetic was all about the poet's emotions and the poet's ability to see these feelings externalized and then to present them as an image. Look at this image of Pound and think hidden swastika. Pound feels isolated. He is lonely. To alleviate this alienation, he is willing to destroy everything else that exists, for one cannot feel lonely when there is nothing to be separate from. 
It is no coincidence that Pound has seen Francesca amid primal things. In Freudian terms, he wishes to overcome his feelings of separations by complete orgastic union with the self, by shutting out the external world. This is not a love poem. It is a lust poem, a capitalist lust poem, a hymn in praise of consumerism practiced within a well-ordered corporate state. Pound sees love as a thing and not as an active process whereby each of the individuals retains personal integrity. It is a dangerous way to love. A thing can be lost and leave one hoping for all eternity that I might find you again, but only ensures that the one searching will always remain alone. Or again, as Karl Marx has said, the less you are and the less you express of your life, the more you have and the greater is your alienated life. It is the difference between having a life and being alive. It is the difference between taking possession of your life and living your life. One attitude sees life as a thing, the other as a process, and there is no process greater than growth. In the title to his love poem, Milton Acorn doesn't target or label the one he loves. You growing is a statement of what Acorn is witnessing in his love and he records the great joy he feels when he sees growth and life in this person. What is important here is the process of loving, and Acorn's feelings of love are enhanced by what he witnesses in his loved one, growth. Acorn, like Pound, is separate from his loved one, but this does not create anxiety in Acorn in the same way it does in Pound. Rather, it proves an opportunity to witness his loved one's thought threading and the delicate strength of your focus. Here, the reader can be seen as the poet's lover and not just a sounding board for a frustrated ego full of contempt for the collective. Even though Acorn is separate, the connection his po poem weaves with its subject continues through space, and one can imagine it continuing through all time. Acorn's love is not threatened by limitations, but is a, is a means to overcome limitations. His clamor of voices, unlike Pound's turmoil of speech, is very much alive and active. While turmoil suggests a state of babbling-like confusion, a clamor of voices is a collective of unified speakers with voices ringing together and with purpose. Even when surrounded by demanding faces and noises, Acorn is not alone. In contrast to Pound, Pound's confusion of people, where he needs to escape at all costs, Milton Acorn is always connected to the larger world and all life in it, a life that remains apart from me, but vivid. While separated by a distance, his loved one is still as vivid as when I kissed you and chuckled. Even at a distance, his love creates happiness. Acorn is not dictating orders in this poem. The tone of you growing is almost a whisper, and one can imagine it being tickled into the ear of the listener. Acorn gives gentle advice and expresses concern. Life is hard. However, he does not want his loved one to escape life, but to live it as best as one can, never being beaten down by its difficulties. 
Wherever you are, be fearless. In contrast to wanting a possession, he expresses a concern that remains connected. And wherever I am, I hope to know you're moving vivid beyond me. And what is most striking about Acorn's vivid vision of a collective connection is the sharing of struggle. So I grow by the strength of you fighting for yourself. And he does not end the poem with a harsh single capital A alone, but with a list of interconnectedness. Yourself, many selves, your life, many lives. In early versions of You Growing, it ended with many lives, but like its title, the poem continued to grow, and Acorn added the words, your people. The phrase was added at a time when Acorn was involved with the struggle for an independent socialist Canada during the 1970s, when he was a member of the Canadian Liberation Movement. This is where I met him. One can imagine that the poem could continue to grow and the list at the end could continue to include many peoples and even your planet. Clearly, Acorn's You Growing is a rewrite of the earlier Francesca, and one can, by simply reading the two poems, see why Acorn included You Growing as an illustration in his essay on not being banned by the Nazis, right before he starts railing away at the Ezra Pounders, who look on life as a process of decay. The two poems are opposing views in what on the surface appears to be very similar poems. With 12 lines each, Pound and Acorn both unequivocally define a relationship with a distanced loved one. Subtle differences of form blend with their content. Acorn uses regular lines of six to nine beats and balanced stanzas of six lines. Pound uses irregular lines of one to thirteen beats, broken up into two uneven stanzas of four and eight lines. Acorn creates a soft sing sign tone with a melodic and harmonious rhythm. Pound's many single-syllable words shoot out one at a time. Acorn showers his love with the soft, nurturing sound of rain. Pound sprays his possession with the angry, machine-gun beat of bullets. As the world around us may indeed be drying as a leaf, do we strive to be free of the ordinary? Do we continue to fill our hands with flowers? Do we pluck them out of the ground in order to possess them, letting them only exist if they can provide some immediate satisfaction to our desires, killing them and the world as we do so? Or do we simply learn to kiss gentle petals and chuckle as we find a vivid focus warm in the sunshine, realizing the beauty cut off from its own roots is the night. Out of today's demanding clamor of voices, the vivid struggle of poetics and its connection to the world continues. Let me finish with some of my own words. For I whisper love with the cool breath of spring, as nestling feathers tickle your neck, hoping to free you with the heart. Thank you.